Hello, beloved. As we continue with our Luke study, now we come to chapter 3 in our study book. And this chapter will cover Jesus' first sermon and then how he moves on to call disciples and form Christian community. So today we begin with um, claiming the story, your story, and as our chapter begins, it talks about um, an eight millimeter camera um, from someone's childhood that took pictures of their childhood. And uh, years later, this person watches, uh, the writer watches uh, one of his childhood birthdays. So think about what are some of your fondest childhood memories and maybe your best um, childhood memory of a birthday, and think about who you invited. As I was thinking about that, I remember my last birthday when we lived in Corinth, Mississippi. I turned 10 years old, and I have a twin sister. We uh, celebrated with a bowling party. Do you remember ever having a bowling party or a skating party for your birthday? We have pictures of that. And so I, in my mind's eye, I can see who attended, and obviously they responded to an invitation. And we were surrounded by a circle of friends. And so that's a good memory. And so as a way of kind of connecting to that, Think about how your life has been formed by the invitations you have received and you have responded to. The invitations that we receive and the invitations that we respond to direct us toward relationships that we form. As my children were growing up, I've told you this, I told them, be careful about the friends that you choose because you will become the friends that you choose. You will be influenced by that group. We are influenced by the relationships we choose to invest our lives in. And the same is true of community. And so as we get more deeply into this chapter next week, hopefully, uh, if nothing else comes up, I anticipate our meeting in person next week on the first Wednesday of February. And we'll look at Luke chapter 5, the calling of the disciples into Christian community to follow Christ, to learn from him, and to form that community. And so today we're looking at chapter 4 in Luke and we begin today with how, again, another picture of how Jesus is emerging. Prior to the calling of disciples, he goes home. From his early travels, he goes home to Nazareth to preach in his hometown synagogue. Now, if you heard the sermon last this past Sunday, uh, you will have already heard the sermon on this passage, Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. So again, this is a crucial moment where we get insight into who Jesus is and what his mission and ministry will be all about. So, as you begin to read chapter 3, um, it talks about the formation of community, which we'll talk more about next week. But as you turn the page, on page 30, it talks about the character of Jesus' ministry. So at the top of page 30, it says, First words are memorable for a variety of reasons. So what we find in Luke chapter 4, beginning at verse 14, is Jesus entering his hometown synagogue, 
And see, we have a perspective, we have a camera angle that we already know the significance of Jesus and who he is. But these are the hometown folks that he grew up with. I remember preaching my first sermons around Jackson, Tennessee, and it was an odd feeling for both me and those who knew me growing up because they see you in a certain way growing up, and now you're standing at a pulpit proclaiming. And so it's an odd experience. It's hard to go from just being ordinary, an ordinary person, to being a spokesperson for God. And so even for Jesus, we get insight into this um, beginning to go public with his preaching and teaching about the kingdom of God and his identity as the Messiah. And so... As our study says, again on page 30, first words are memorable for a variety of reasons. And the next paragraph says, Luke has provided words spoken by Jesus before he speaks, before he speaks at his hometown synagogue in Nazareth. And this is the beginning of his public ministry. The passage found and read by Jesus serves as his inaugural which was the theme I used in the sermon that you hopefully have heard from last Sunday, the inaugural for his ministry. And his words point to the character of his ministry that is about to unfold. So let's talk about what those words reveal. First, again, you have a spirit-driven um, narrative. Um, in Luke chapter 4, as we said at the beginning, Luke returns from the Jordan River full of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So now, the next story, look at the linkage, look at the wording, look at how it's described. So as we get to chapter 4, verse 14, it says, notice, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. So that's very significant. He has been empowered by his wilderness experience. That's very significant. So you have Spirit there, Spirit uh, being endowed by the Spirit at his baptism, driven into the wilderness by the Spirit, returning being empowered by the Spirit. So Spirit, this is a Spirit-driven narrative. And so then it goes on in verse 16, Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised, and he enters the synagogue. So the attendant, is be, it would be like being the liturgist for the day. The attendant hands him the scroll. He unfolds it, perhaps the reading of that day, or the reading that Jesus chose was from the prophet Isaiah. Again, we're familiar with these words, but do we understand the significance? Notice the linkage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord, God, has anointed me. The meaning of Messiah is the anointed one. The Lord has anointed me. Why? Why have I been chosen? Why have I been empowered by the Spirit to speak, to proclaim? He sent me to proclaim good news to whom? The poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners, recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I mentioned in the sermon, if you heard it, the year of Jubilee. Let me go a little more deeply into that in this teaching session because it's so significant. Your assignment is to go read Leviticus chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. In the early portion of Leviticus 25, 
you will find the details of the Jubilee year. I'm fascinated by this. In the life of the people of Israel as the people of God, there were cycles of time, just like we have the seasons, our liturgical seasons that tell the story of Jesus, the story of God, that's based on the Jewish tradition of having seasons that tell the story of what it means to experience the God of Israel. So each week has a cycle that begins with uh, and ends with the observance of the Sabbath. At sunset, which we, we, we practice our calendar and our patterns of life with sunrise as the beginning of a day for us. Uh, in Jewish culture, sundown begins the new day. So on Friday evenings at sundown, that begins the Sabbath. And that weekly Sabbath observance is the pattern of your life for rest, renewal, to celebrate the goodness of God, to be in community around the table. So that's the weekly pattern of Sabbath. There were also festivals, primary festivals, that told the story of God's presence and power and grace and deliverance. So the, that pattern of ritual, of um, primary festivals, tells the story. So in the midst of all of that, there was a pattern of every seventh year, the seventh day is the Sabbath, every seventh year, was the Sabbath year. And there was like a reordering of life, a starting again, a beginning again. So in the Sabbath year, there was renewal. Well, what's fascinating as you read in Leviticus 25, there is a cycle of seven years. Seven times seven is 49. And so the Jubilee year is the 50th year. The 50th year, the Jubilee year, was to be a year of total reset, of total renew, renewal. Everyone got a new lease on life. Everyone, as a collective experience of the transforming grace of God, who needed that most? Those who were the most vulnerable and the most burdened. Imagine, imagine yourself today working two or three jobs, living paycheck to paycheck, to paycheck and then you go to a quick cash, a quick loan, um, title loan type place, because you're strapped for cash and you sign away your car and then the deadline comes, you can't pay it, you lose your car and you get in this downward spiral. Well, what if some gracious, benevolent person from First United Methodist Church became aware of your plight? You've lost your job, you've lost your home, uh, you've lost every asset you have because you got caught up in quick, easy credit that was not quick and easy. And in that downward spiral, you lost everything. But let's say a gracious, benevolent person from First United Methodist Church not only pays off all of your debts, but restores your nest egg, finds you a place to live, and enables you to be capable, have the capacity uh, to go out, use your qualifications, find a job, get on your feet, and begin again. That would be the experience of Jubilee. 
folks, we deal with our clients every day that come through the pantry and through our doors for emergency help who are good people who got caught up in a downward spiral just like that. And so we're here to help. So just to kind of give you a contemporary example of what that might look like, that's Jubilee. That's a new beginning. By the grace of God, your debts are wiped out, you are restored, your capacity to thrive is restored. So that's the picture we get. And Jesus says, on this day, as you hear this, as I'm proclaiming this, which they were familiar with, the Jubilee year, it was never fully implemented because it was too radical. <laughs> Bankers and loan owners, they didn't want to return their property to former loan owner, uh, landowners who'd had, you know, you're the landowner now because you confiscated their land because they were in debt to you. That's not good business. So it was never fully implemented, but Jesus says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. You see, there was a messianic expectation that when the Messiah comes, then he'll implement the Jubilee year. Someday, someday, pie in the sky, someday, everything will be made right. Everyone will be equal. Everybody will get a fresh start, but we'll wait on the Messiah to do that. That's what's going on in the passage. So Jesus says to his hometown folks, today's the day. And this is what I'm all about. This is my God-given identity. I have been anointed to anoint. You remember, um, Brad Grant shared with me that insight that the word for anoint, meaning using olive oil, which was used to refresh you in the harshness of that environment, to freshen up and be anointed also was the phrase and the word that was used for mercy. So the job of the anointed one is to bring incredible mercy which is grace, God's transforming loving kindness. So that's the mission of Jesus. That's the kingdom of God is among you. When agape rules, mercy is in charge. I'm going to say that again. When agape rules, mercy is in charge. And anointed ones anoint with healing and refreshing balm to help people begin again. That was the mission and ministry of Jesus. And so what's our mission and ministry? Do we align with that? That's the question. Do we align with that kingdom vision, that jubilee vision of Jesus, what I call the Jesus agenda? Do we align? So let's think as we live the story, can that be what discipleship is all about? Now think about this. If we are following the anointed one who anoints with healing balm, Shouldn't that be what discipleship is all about? I think so. So may the anointed one call and anoint us to be the healing balm for a broken and hurting world. Where through us, through sharing the story of grace and the extravagant grace of God, people find a way to begin again to be restored, to be whole, and to share that goodness of God with others in ever-widening circles.
because grace and mercy are contagious. Isn't that what discipleship should mean? The abundance of God's grace shared and that restores a healing balm. So think about your own discipleship. Is that what discipleship means for you? If we follow Jesus, the anointed one that anoints, should we be part of that mission and ministry? Will you think about that and pray about it? Well, let's pray now. God, thank you for your anointing grace that is a healing balm. We thank you for how we've received it. Now, help us to pass it along freely and contagiously. Help us to share it in ever-widening circles to glorify your true nature, your true name, the power of agape, extravagant love. For it's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. All right, folks, I will continue to take these uh, sessions in our study, but next Wednesday I look forward to seeing you in Jeff Wall Hall at 6 p.m., and we will be glad to see each other and study together as we continue in the Gospel of Luke. So for next week, the first Wednesday of February, we'll be reading Luke chapter 5. So bless you. I'll see you soon.